So um, this is the 12th lecture of the series, which is the last one in the, the group and uh, ecosystems and climate. Um, and today the lecture is coming from uh, Dr. Dionysus Reitzos, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Biology uh, of University of Athens in Greece. Um, he has a BSc in marine biology, an MSc in fishery science, and a PhD in remote sensing and biological oceanography which were from uh, Newcastle, Aberdeen, and Plymouth Universities, respectively. Um, after that, he did six years of postdoctoral research uh, in Greece and Saudi Arabia, and worked as a senior research scientist um, at Plymouth Marine Laboratory for seven years. Uh, he's interested in satellite remote sensing applications in ocean color, phytoplankton, fisheries, all in relation to regional environmental variability and climate change. And since the early stages of his PhD, uh, somewhere around, I guess, 2003, 2004, um, he followed a multidisciplinary approach, uh, merging satellite and in situ ship measurements uh, to investigate the impact of oceanic warming on marine ecosystems. Uh, since 2019, he's been running the Oceanography and Earth Observation Group at the University of Athens. So he is more than qualified uh, to talk to us today about ecosystem indicators and ecosystem monitoring. So um, with that, I will hand over to Dionysus. Uh, and Thank you very, very much, Tom. I'm going to try to share a screen. And please let me know if it is full screen and exactly as I'm seeing. Is it okay? Perfect. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a big pleasure for me, and thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. It's a big pleasure for me to talk about uh, some work that I have been doing the last 20 years. Um, I first came across um, satellite remote sensing during my PhD under Samantha Lavender um, in 2003, and I'm going to show you a little bit from uh, this part of my work for the Atlantic Ocean, but then we're going to move on to Mediterranean, the Red Sea, the Indian Ocean. So I will try to have several different applications of satellite remote sensing on ecological indicators and in particular with an emphasis on phytoplankton phenology. So the lecture is going to run approximately for one hour. So, Tom, feel free to stop me. I'm going to put my alarm as well. All right. We live in a blue planet that is uh, 71 to 73 percent is covered by water. The vast majority of it, it's the marine environment. We need to understand the functioning of the marine ecosystem. We need to understand their response to global anthropogenic and not changes in order to be able to predict their future. In order to do so, in order to monitor the marine environment, we need long-term and spatially extended data sets. Those data sets uh, and the long-term and large-scale biological dynamics in many marine ecosystems in the world remain poorly understood. The reason being uh, is due to the lack of in situ in water measurements. Regardless how much technology has progressed, and we, here we can see gliders, we can see ship measurements, a CTD, um, bioargo floats, um, we even put uh, machinery on animals and birds to track them down. Regardless how much we try to monitor the environment, it is impossible to be everywhere at the same time. That's why there are several ecosystems around the world that we know nearly nothing about. This need to find long-term and spatial extent data set did not come during this era. Marine scientists started approximately more than 100 years ago to be willing to get measurements for instance, with a psychic disk, which measures the turbidity 
of the water column and in the open oceanic this signal mainly comes from the microscopic marine organisms that live within and you can see with Forel Ule and other ocean color um, data sets of the era they have been able to reproduce astonishing well um, the spatial distribution and the temporal distribution of uh, oceanic phytoplankton. On the left hand side I have uh, a satellite derived MODIS and on the right hand side from in situ uh, in water measurements for many 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 decades ago. It is astonishing what people have achieved. In a sense we could call it the citizen science project of the era. Back then they used to take the Seki disc or the Forel Ule um, scale and they used to look at the water and get an information out of it. Have a look. These certainly qualitative uh, data set. We can have a look at the oligotrophic gyre of, of the Atlantic, at the north and the south, the upwelling systems of Africa. Um, at the southern Atlantic, the eutrophic northern Atlantic, but even imagine their old technology was so sensitive to even separate the oligotrophic Mediterranean Sea into the ultra oligotrophic eastern Mediterranean and the western Mediterranean, exactly the same way as we see from satellites. It is incredible what they managed to do um, by discovering and creating new tools. One of the pioneers was um, Sir Alistair Hardy that started uh, his career at the beginning of the 1900s and he discovered the continuous plankton recorder. Imagine, because we have 2023, it's been exactly 100 years since Sir Alistair Hardy mentioned that if we manage to mark those color changes of the water and these are correctly interpreted, we may in the future find an aircraft, back then there was no satellites in order to be mentioned like that, but an aircraft, something that will go around the earth and like that, if we use this data set, we will be able to make rapid surveys of surface conditions in relation to the fisheries. So it's been at least 100 years well known that by knowing the color of the ocean, we may start understanding how the ecosystem works and how higher trophic levels are impacted. The modern era, uh, approximately 19, at the end of 1970s, uh, the CZCS was the first satellite uh, to start observing global ocean color spatiotemporal distribution. These sensors on board the satellite Clark Force have been sampling the Earth with a gap from the CZCS until the more modern era during the 1970s. In, uh, 1997 of sea waves. The very interesting part is that the remote sensing offers a cost effective approach to detect large scale biophysical interactions. Indeed, since the satellite era, we have been able to understand and to monitor regions that we wouldn't have access to any in situ data. This is one of the beauty of. Uh, the satellite remote sensing is that it doesn't have any borders. Whoever on Earth can monitor, can research whichever part on Earth they like. Why do we care? Why NASA was interested in launching a satellite in the 70s with a technology that they start building it at the end of the 60s? Um, why would so many marine scientists, 100 years ago, they wanted to monitor it? the color of the oceans. This is due to the microscopic algae called phytoplankton. They literally exist everywhere, in every aquatic environment. They are an integral part of the Earth's ecosystem and because they are the base of the marine food web, they are capable of changing the higher trophic levels. 
in a sense, any alteration in their abundance or timing, it will have an impact on higher trophic levels. Growing in such massive scales, they are capable of changing the biogeochemical cycling and the climate processes. And after all, they produce 50% of the oxygen that we breathe and they remove the liquid old phytoplankton, which is called petrol, that the Homo sapiens managed to get this from uh, inside, deep inside the earth, after millions and millions of years, and put it back in the atmosphere, which is a fantastic thing to do. Very, very clever. Phytoplankton is capable of absorbing carbon dioxide and is helping a little bit from this sense. One of the things that we can get through the ocean color and phytoplankton are the phytoplankton indicators. It's not only the abundance, the overall phytoplankton biomass that is important. It's the primary production, the rate of carbon fixation, the phytoplankton size and community structure, but also the phenology. Regardless of the amount of uh, phytoplankton, it is the timing that comes in a specific region. The ecological indicators are very important because they are quantifiable metrics that characterize an ecosystem, its structure, its composition and function. One of the most important things is that the ecological indicators may serve as an early warning signal of ecological disturbances. In a sense, those tiny microscopic um, marine algae are capable of changing even faster than the actual physics until uh, we start detecting at least. In biological oceanography, we're very keen in what limits phytoplankton. There are several parameters that impact their growth, their abundance. If we have to say what are the limiting factors? There are two, light and nutrients. That's why we can separate the world's ecosystem into the nutrient limited and light limited. The ecosystem towards the poles, the higher latitudes, are the light limited environments. Whereas around the tropical region, and around the equator, we have the nutrient-limited environments. Oceanic warming, something that is evident all over the world and in the majority of the places, can impact phytoplankton and these microscopic algae directly through their growth rates, metabolism, or indirectly through thermal stratification, thus nutrient availability, and grazing, which is the zooplankton. Oceanic warming does not only impact phytoplankton abundance, but also their bloom timing, because oceanic warming impacts the stratification level and the nutrients that are trapped below the thermocline are not available at the right time and thus changes the bloom timing. But why do we care about the bloom timing? Why is this so important? Phenology relates to the timing of the biological events, typically the primary producers, on land and in the oceans. For instance, in the North Atlantic, we have the very well-known spring bloom. And it happens during the spring bloom because the light availability is way more the water column is very well mixed during the winter time. There is plenty of nutrients available. And when the first light comes and the te atmospheric temperature starts getting warmer during spring, we have the first uh, signs of the bloom. One of the metrics that we can get when we calculate phenology it's the initiation, the peak, the termination, and duration. And those metrics are very important in order to be able to understand if in a given year it has changed, there is a delay in the initiation or there is an earlier termination. Why do we care about the specific time of the events? 
This is due to the much mismatch hypothesis. Basically, this figure has been adapted by Trevor Platt's The Nature Paper in 2003, just to add this particular uh, panel. On top, you can see in blue the larvae. The larvae of any organism. Uh, the majority of the marine organisms have a planktonic stage. During this period of time, they're feeding in the euphotic zone and at surface uh, near um, where phytoplankton grows. And then they may return, even sessile animals may feed directly on phytoplankton. So when those larvae are available, they need food. This color, the green, is when their presence overlaps with phytoplankton growth. When there is a mismatch, there is a delay in the initiation of the bloom, so the bloom starts later, we suddenly have a mismatch because the larvae are present, but their food is not. So the timing of phytoplankton growth period has far-reaching impacts on the marine food web structure and ecosystem functioning. Trevor Platt has published several papers uh, on this subject, which I'm going to talk about uh, my most uh, favorite one, the spring algal bloom in the North Atlantic and the impact of larval fish survival. One of the reasons why I find this paper very interesting, it's the fact that they're dealing with an organism, the haddock, that is a benthopelagic organism that is living in very deep waters, 400, 600, 700 meters depth. However, their larvae have a planktonic stage and they live very near the surface. So, Trevor starts his nature paper by saying this link has been suspected for more than 100 years, but its verification has had to wait for technology with sufficient spatial and temporal resolution to appear. This is the anomaly of the timing of the spring bloom. In a sense, whatever you see on the left hand side, it is a later bloom for one week or two weeks, or an earlier bloom for one, two or three weeks. On this axis, we see the survival index of the haddock larvae. Basically, by sampling the North Atlantic for several years during the spring bloom, they found that during the periods that the bloom timing was two to three weeks earlier, you have the highest survival index of a species that lives at the bottom of the sea. Basically, if the phytoplankton, the algae, moves towards the right and the bloom delays, we have minimum survival, whereas if it moves earlier, the overlapping timing is very important and the survival increases. How do we calculate? How, how can we run it on satellite-derived datasets or even in situ? For instance, even if it's satellite-derived that we have a pixel every one kilometer or four kilometers, or even if we have a station um, with enough data set, it needs at least to be weekly or bi-weekly in order to be able to calculate properly and the, the exact phenology. But we take the information from this station or from the pixel and we create a time series. We create a, a, a climatology. For instance, this is based on 25 years. And we calculate the cumulative sums of anomalies to decompose a little bit the time series and to uh, reduce the noise. Then a threshold criterion is set and whatever over exceeds the threshold criterion, we have the initiation the peak and the termination once it goes below the threshold criterion. For methodologies, you can see many papers from uh, Marie Fanny Racolt. Um, I put just a few examples here, but uh, she has been working on se for several years on phytoplankton phenology, so the methodology can be found there. 
Um, this is an example of phytoplankton phenology in the global oceans. And we can see all the different metrics, the initiation, the maximum, the peak, the termination, the duration, the amplitude. And we can see for every single environment uh, across the globe, and we can derive information of when does our environment blooms. The question is, can we trust the satellite-derived uh, phenology? And I'm going to show you two very clear examples that uh, we have been uh, running the phenology algorithm on in situ data sets, but also um, uh, satellite derived. On the left hand side, it's uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. We have two stations, the S11 and S16, the two figures below. And this time series ran for approximately 30 years. So the concurrent in space and time data sets we have like from 1997 from uh, CWIPS until uh, 2017. And here we use the Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative, the OCCI. You can see how well the phytoplankton bloom based on satellite and in situ in black it's the in situ and the green it's the chlorophyll from satellite derived, that they start exactly at the same um, period of time, the initiation, but also they terminate um, exactly on the same period of time. The interesting part is that although those two stations are very close to each other, the one is quite coastal, and the S16 is the more open oceanic. So the seasonal cycle differentiates a little bit. It's a little bit more abrupt and more oligotrophic than the S11. And this is captured very well um, by the satellite derived information and the initiation and termination and all the phenology metrics fall exactly within the same periods of time. Another application that we followed a bioarco float at the northern part of the Red Sea that lasted for approximately a year and a half. And the gray dots are the matchups around the bioarco float wherever it was moving. And then we created the seasonal cycle within that given year. Please focus on the black line, which is the arco float chlorophyll. And the green, it's the surface from satellites. So we can see that they fluctuate very well together. But most importantly, the initiation starts, and this is on daily data set, starts um, just a few, with a few days difference, four or five days of difference, and it terminates exactly uh, at the same period of time. Whereas when we do the integrated chlorophyll of Argo, the first 100 meters integrated, we can see a big change because this phytoplankton live in uh, deeper uh, layers of the water column. So we see a delayed initiation. Perhaps it has to do with the lights and the later termination lasting way longer. But overall, based on the surface information, we have uh, evidence from very long time series, in situ time series, that um, the information that we get um, is uh, very well. This is a, an example. I'm going to now show you some examples of phytoplankton phenology from several different seas from the Atlantic, from uh, the Mediterranean, from the Red Sea, and some impacts on higher trophic levels. So during my PhD, I started working with a continuous plankton recorder, and I always wanted to relate the information that we get from the CPR uh, with the satellite-derived information. The continuous plankton recorder is filtering um, the water as it is towed behind ships of opportunity and the water enters, passes through a silk and the silk is wrapped up in a cassette. So basically it goes back to the lab 
And the first analysis that they do, it's the color of the oceans. After that, it is cut in uh, 18 kilometers tall, and we can actually see the taxonomic analysis of zooplankton and phytoplankton. More than 550 different taxa uh, are recorded in each uh, uh, tall, are looked. Here, the first analysis is the CPR filter. And this is a visual uh, inspection of the color of the silk. So the first category is no color, the second category is very pale green, the third category pale green, and the fourth category green. This has been run for several years, and in order for a technician to name one category, there are always two that say uh, they are actually taking the measurements and they have to agree. Um, and in order for a person, a technician to train, they need at least two, three years of training until they say in which color category. So they train their eyes and their brain algorithm quite a lot. What I was interested in was to see the relationship between each category, pale green, pale very pale green and green, and the satellite derived information. So we have like thousands of data points. We managed to have enough match up points with C waves. And here you can see the relationship that every category has a very distinct chlorophyll value. Using this relationship, we were able to retrospectively calculate chlorophyll back in 1948 during a period, although the continuous plankton recorder runs from 1931, um, from 1948, the methodology remains unchanged. And here we can see a very abrupt change and an increase at the, in 1987, the well-known um, mid-80s regime shift. One of the things that I wanted to look at was the phytoplankton phenology. Um, the problem with the satellite data set is after the seas of CZCS and the beginning of the sea waves, we had a very big gap. However, the continuous plankton recorder was available before, during CZCS, during the gap, and during the modern times. And this is the results. From 1948 until recently, the color is the phytoplankton color index, and these are the months from January until December, from January until December. So if we see from 1948 until mid 80s, we used to have a very distinct spring bloom and a very distinct in most of the years autumn bloom. So basically, as you can see from CZCS, and the phytoplankton color index, we used to have uh, two well-known blooms, the spring and the autumn one. Whereas after the mid-80s regime shift, we start seeing a merging of those two um, in most of the years to have a later spring and a continuous um, phytoplankton bloom. Something that it is evident, <laughs> sorry, Something that is evident in the satellite data sets. <coughs> in order to see, by retrospectively calculating and adjusting everything <coughs> to see waves, uh, we can see that there is an abrupt shift in the mid 80s. Sorry for my voice. I think it's better, all right. And we can see that uh, by comparing the two satellite eras and the phytoplankton color index, we can see the very strong abrupt shift in the mid 80s. We were wondering what exactly happens. And you can read the papers from Philip Chris Reed, Gregory Bogrand, they have done a fantastic job on that. Uh, here we have the chlorophyll anomalies and the northern hemisphere temperatures. So basically taking the temperatures of the whole northern hemisphere and linking it to chlorophyll anomalies 
in, at the North Atlantic. We can see a very uh, strong relationship. And abruptly, in the mid-80s, 1987, there is an abrupt shift in both abrupt warming and an increase in uh, chlorophyll. This is the cumulative sums. Use the statistical approach to decompose the signal, to lose all the noise, and to suddenly see the abrupt slow and to identify uh, the exact timing that happened, which was 1980. Seven. Now let's go somewhere warmer. Let's go to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, one recent paper by Salcado Hernaz and uh, Maril Fanny Rapolds uh, that uh, they reported the trends of the phytoplankton phenology in the whole Mediterranean Sea. And you can see through the time series, one of the very interesting results that uh, they got is that the Eastern Mediterranean, the most oligotrophic part of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, there is nowadays a reduced duration and intensity of the main um, peak of phytoplankton growth. One of the very interesting parts of the phytoplankton phenology and plotting based on satellite derived information is the fact that you don't need only to plot the time series, but you can calculate for every pixel. Like that, you have a phenology map these are a little bit difficult to uh, interpret in a sense that we don't look at chlorophyll here, but we actually look at number, we look at time. For instance, let's go to the first panel, which is the initiation of the bloom. The green corresponds to January, March. So we see that the initiation of the bloom takes place during January, whereas there are other places um, that the initiation starts in approximately end of October, beginning of November. Have a look at the second panel, which is the timing of the peak, how different the Northern Aegean Sea is. And the peak is taking place at the end of the spring, um, whereas in other regions, it is occurring at the very early beginning, late autumn, early winter. So like that, we can uh, calculate on a time series, but also spatially to identify for every ecosystem uh, and to create an atlas of phenology, which is very useful for several different uh, studies. In the Red Sea, for instance, that is an, a region that it was extremely undersampled, especially before the 2010, before the advent of the um, University of Kaust, which since then they're sampling the Red Sea um, in an astonishing um, scale and rhythm. Um, but before then, uh, the in situ information was indeed negligible. What we can see here is that the majority of the open oceanic regions, if you look at the blue, which is the chlorophyll, it is a typical winter blooming environment, whereas the southern part and the very coastal region, we have a very strong peak uh, during the summer that I'm going to talk to you about that uh, later on. The Red Sea in general is a very oligotrophic ecosystem. Uh, however, the southern part, it reaches values uh, nearly at a uh, eutrophic level. And we can see that during the whole period of time, um, and this is based on sea waves, which of course had a lot of data gaps, even the climatological weekly data points were not enough. So in a sense, the single sensors, there were periods of time that they have never sampled the Southern Red Sea. And this is a very important um, part of the, of the basin. The reason being, the Red Sea has like negligible precipitation, approximately less than six centimeters per year. So it is a very strong rainy day in Northern Europe. It has no riverine inputs and is surrounded by desert. So the nutrients from runoff do not 
exist, basically. So we have two main mechanisms. One, the convection of the north, where we have a very strong cyclonic eddy. And the main mechanism is the Arabian Sea influx. So basically, the horizontal intrusion during winter and summer from the Indian Ocean due to the monsoons. The monsoons are the prevailing winds over the northern uh, Indian Ocean, and they are changing, they are reversing their direction biannually over the whole Indian Ocean. And this drives one of the most dynamic interaction between atmosphere, uh, oceans, and continents. The Red Sea is here. During the winter time, this cyclonic movement pushes waters from the Gulf of Aden inside. This is due to the mountains around Somalia, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and Eritrea from Africa sides. So the mountains actually constrain the surface winds orographically and push them inside the Red Sea, as you can see here with the arrows. Along with the surface winds, it is pushing a lot of water inside. Even during summer, when the monsoon reverses, those very strong summer monsoons create an upwelling here that is pushing water in, in the Red Sea, but at different um, depth, approximately 65 meters of depth. This is the, in red, the annual mean of chlorophyll for the whole Red Sea, superimposed on the multivariate ENSO index. Have a look how strongly related, positively related is this climate index, um, which is a very good representation of ENSO. And not only it's uh, related with the overall chlorophyll, but those gray vertical uh, bars, it's the phytoplankton growth. So basically during El Nino, opposite to what we know for the tropical regions, because in the tropics, when we have an El Nino, uh, which means a very strong temperature for the atmosphere across the globe, we usually have an impact on thermal stratification. And because the tropics and the temperate seas rely on nutrients below the thermocline, those nutrients are usually trapped. Uh, Berenfeld has a very nice paper in Donne in 2006 in Nature uh, showing this mechanism. So here we can see that during La Nina, we have two to four weeks um, less duration. And during El Nino, we may reach to four, five weeks of uh, more duration. And we were wondering why the Red Sea, a very typical tropical ecosystem, is reacting so differently. It's for one reason. The main mechanism of nutrients, the nutrients that the Red Sea is relying upon, it's not through the water column, but from the Indian Ocean. So here we talk about advection. What they need is the volume transport, the higher volume transport, the very strong wind speed during the winter monsoon in order the whole, the chlorophyll of almost the whole basin to flourish. So during positive uh, multivariate ENSO index, the MEI, during positive phases, we have very strong, even 10 to 15 weeks of longer duration and phenology in the Red Sea. To summarize, and I don't want to enter into more details during positive MEI phases, the local winds become way stronger. And these zonal winds are responsible for pushing Indian eutrophic, Indian eutrophic in comparison to the oligotrophic, to the highly oligotrophic Red Sea nutrient-rich water masses in, and we see the results of the satellite-derived chlorophyll. In contrast, during negative phases of MEI, um, we can see the reduction of winds, the reduction of nutrients, and uh, a reduction in phytoplankton biomass. In order to learn more about the bloom timing, we need very strong 
data sets in space and time. Before the production of Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative, we were unable to see, uh, especially for the Southern Red Sea, um, observations of chlorophyll, especially during July and August, due to the haze and clouds, due to the extreme temperature, but also due to the dust storms over the region during uh, the summer. When this MERS product occurred, we start having 60 to 80 percent coverage and we start uh, observing a summer bloom. Although we used to know the, the Red Sea as a winter blooming environment, the reason being through a circulation model, but also in situ observation, observations during the summer, although the summer monsoon sends the surface waters of the Red Sea out, so we have a strong surface outflow, at the same time, these very strong summer monsoons create an upwelling in the Gulf of Aden, and the upwelling, the vertical line is where the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea meets. This upwelling is pushing water inside the Red Sea. But because the surface waters are coming out due to the summer monsoon, these waters, which are colder, fresher, and nutrient-rich, nutrient rich, um, are actually suppressed and sandwiched at approximately 60-65 meters depth. Due to the very high dynamic environment in the Red Sea, those waters are easily penetrated by cyclonic and anticyclonic eddies, and that's why during summer it's flourishing. And this is the relationship between chlorophyll and Indian monsoon index and the winds, how a very clear relationship showing the stronger the summer monsoon is, the higher the chlorophyll in the Red Sea Basin. One of the interesting things of phenology, as I told you before, is that you can plot it spatially. What we saw in the Gulf of Aden is that a big differentiation between the half, half of the Gulf near the Red Sea and the outside, the outer layer. Again, we were only able to start uh, looking at this, and this is a study that uh, back then a bachelor student that was uh, working, Anthony, John Anthony Gittings, uh, was working at Plymouth Marine Lab with myself, with uh, Trevor and Suba, um, and he's now approximately 10 years in ocean color. Um, he started in approximately 2014. So he investigated, John investigated the phytoplankton phenology in the Gulf of Aden. And we can see that in panel A, we have a very strong summer bloom. We could find only one paper that they had in situ measurements uh, indicating that indeed during August they have found five milligrams of cubic meter and to support uh, our evidence. Especially in the tropical places where the temperature is already very warm, but also the temperate seas like the Mediterranean. The problem with oceanic warming is that it changes the density of the upper layer. By changing the density, it creates two water masses. The upper water mass, which is lighter because the density is decreased, so those lighter waters are occupying the subsurface, whereas the colder, more dense waters are heavier and they sink. So those water masses are a little bit difficult to get mixed, especially if it is a very strong um, if there is a very high temperature in a given year. This happens naturally during the seasonal cycle, and this is, can be the summer stratification, and this can be the winter mixing. However, here we talk about climate warming, and in a given year, if 
a region is way warmer than it should be, it starts having a very big impact. And this is what is happening typically during the winter time. Due to the temperature drop at the atmosphere, because the weather is not good, it's very wavy, strong, uh, cold winds are cooling the surface, it changes the density, it cools down the surface of the water column. The lack of light, especially in uh, the northern hemisphere and near the poles, the higher latitudes, but everywhere we have winter and summer. And you can see that the mixing of the whole vertical column, and this is the line of temperature, the unified uh, line, whereas during the summer, we have a very strong thermocline. In order to understand the thermocline, one easy example for my brain, at least, is the density of two different liquids. Exactly as we have here, the lighter density of the warm surface and the colder region. Here I have oil and normal water. As you can see, the oil separates from the water due to the, its density. The oil is way lighter, that's why it goes towards the surface, and the water has, um, is heavier and goes below. Exactly where they meet, it's the thermocline. And those environments in the tropics, they rely upon nutrients that are trapped below the thermocline. Unless there is a mechanism to break this and start mixing, those nutrients will remain uh, below the thermocline and they cannot be utilized by the surface um, phytoplankton. In order to visualize that with a bioargo float, but also with satellite derived information, you can see the phenology algorithm says that the initiation of the bloom is here in November and the termination in April. However, the satellite derived information is give us information only for the surface. Let's have a look of what is happening during the warm period of time when we have the stratification, the brand vasala stratification index is very, very strong. The temperature is very warm at the surface and chlorophyll remains at the deep chlorophyll uh, max and very low at surface. Abruptly, when we see the initiation of the bloom, we see that the stratification and the mixed layer depth in black line starts dropping. Uh, and this is when the temperature starts getting cooler and we reach during the peak of the blooming period that we see that the mixed layer depth is very deep, the stratification decreases a lot and temperature becomes homogeneous, oxygenated and chlorophyll everywhere in the whole water column. Exactly as we can see here during the mixing period and during the summer stratification. This is a typical thing that is happening in every temperate uh, and tropical seas. However, it's not only what is happening during the typical seasonal cycle, but also what is happening interannually. Within the seasonal cycle, based on uh, phytoplankton chlorophyll climatology the last 23-24 years, and sea surface temperature, we can see how strongly anticorrelated they are. This is a typical seasonal cycle during the winter period of time. We have um, the coldest periods, and we have the highest chlorophyll concentration and vice versa. This is what it is expected. Here we see the interannual. We take February, which is the peak of chlorophyll, um, and we can see interannually how much does it change and how anticorrelated, strongly anticorrelated is with temperature. So it's not only during the typical seasonal cycle that happens within a year, but interannually as well. And this is where the issue comes. Basically, what this plot says is that when we have a very warm year at the Northern Red Sea, we have much less phytoplankton. In order to visualize that, in the black line, we have the anomalies 
of the mixed layer depth from a hydrodynamic model. And in green, we have the chlorophyll anomalies from satellite-derived uh, OCCI products. We can see how much related uh, they are. Basically, what it says is that the deeper the mixed layer is, the higher the chlorophyll concentration um, at surface. Of course, this relationship is not perfect because if it was perfect, it would have been easy to understand how phytoplankton reacts in any um, parameter. However, because this is only one parameter, we were quite happy to see this very strong uh, relationship. Of course, many other parameters may impact. It's not only the overall biomass of phytoplankton that a warmer year impacts the mixed layer depth and then eventually we have an impact on surface phytoplankton. This is the interannual variability and we have the anomalies of the mixed layer depth and the anomalies of the blooming periods. It's not only the overall biomass, but it's the bloom timing that is impacted. Basically, when we have a very warm year and the mixed layer depth is shallower, the initiation of the bloom happens approximately two to four or five weeks later. I remind you Trevor Splat's um, paper that showed in 2003 the impacts to the higher trophic levels um, when we see um, the impact to, to the higher trophic levels when the bloom is delayed. And this is a, exactly the opposite during cold years of time when the mixed layer depth is much deeper, even 20, 30 meters depth, the bloom initiation comes two to five or six weeks earlier. How this is related and why this is important? Let's go and have a look at the final parts of the presentation that we see the impact of these changes in phytoplankton phenology um, and chlorophyll on the higher trophic levels. We know that marine fish constitutes, constitutes a major source of animal protein and provide an essential source of micronutrients. We are wondering, are the metrics characterizing the fishery stock resources? Are they related to the variability of phytoplankton indicators? This is the phenology interannually, different metrics plotted. Basically, zero is a normal initiation, normal duration, normal termination. In blue, it is the later, and in red, it's the earlier. Basically, you can see the interannual variability, and I would like you to focus in 2003 that we have an earlier bloom initiation based on the phenology algorithm, based on satellite-derived information. We have approximately five to seven weeks earlier initiation. The, du the overall duration was approximately 10 weeks. This was due to the fact that the termination of the bloom was later for approximately three weeks. So basically, 2003 was a very unique year. The moment we spotted that, we were truly uh, interested in finding the reason behind, but also to see if there is an impact on higher trophic levels. This is 2003, plotted as a typical seasonal cycle, so you can actually see um, the initiation of the bloom, how much earlier it was. The overall blooming periods fall within the normal, but this one, the earlier initiation that reads higher levels, that's the Red Sea for the uh, 23 years, we have never spotted such change. We were truly interested to see its relation with higher trophic levels. Here, on the top panel, A, we have 
the initiation anomalies. So basically, this is when it's happening earlier and here when it happens later. And in black line, we have several sardinella species from fisheries cuts uh, from FAO around the Red Sea. And here you can see the very strong relationship and especially in 2003, the landings uh, over the northern half of the Red Sea have been uh, extremely high. And this is the duration anomalies, and we can see the variability of the duration and how this is strongly related uh, again to Sardinella. And here is squid. We have chosen two different groups of fish that are very close to the trophic level, they're close to phytoplankton. That's why we have chosen the small pelagics and the, the squids that um, are quite close to the bottom of the food chain, especially uh, those uh, small squids that we have chosen. And we can see here again in 2003 and the next years how successful the fisheries yield is and how much is related when the duration of the bloom is way stronger. This is another example from the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, we had access uh, through solstice program um, from Southampton uh, with many colleagues from Africa, from Tanzania, Kenya, South Africa, a lovely project that we uh, start having access to fantastic fisheries data sets and start plotting links in between them. Uh, here is a very typical example of um, chlorophyll satellite derived and many, many metric tones of herring sad and anchovies, all the small pelagics uh, over the EZ of Tanzania. This is another example of South Africa. Um, I don't want to go into details because inside the papers we have the whole mechanism of why particular years were higher, why lower, and how this impacts eventually the fisheries. Um, since there are different mechanisms, I'm not going to go into detail, but we can discuss any of them. Um, and here you can see the relationship between choca squid, a very important fisheries resource, the choca squid over South Africa, and the relationship with satellite derived chlorophyll. Um, we have managed to get from uh, the ministry some fantastic fisheries landings. Uh, they were very cooperative. Um, they offered us data sets even at the monthly level the last 20-25 years that were very very useful to derive uh, such relationships. I don't want to waste any more of your time. Um, the message that I would like to pass is that we are able to find such links and to start understanding the marine environments a little bit better due to the satellite derived information, but also supports other technologies like Argo and several other gliders and several other tools that we are able to see the large scale. Since they live in every aquatic environment, phytoplankton abundance, community structure and growth timing alters the higher trophic levels. Uh, these tools are very useful in identifying those changes in order to be able to predict what will happen in a warmer future, which sometimes seems unavoidable. Thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much, Dio. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I think there will be people potentially from the questions that want to catch up with you later, <laughs> contact you by email and all sorts of things. This for... is not an issue at all. That's why I had the, my email. Of course, I would be happy to provide any paper cited uh, over the presentation. Um, we have a number of questions um, that I will, will run through. 
Um, there's usually questions as well about um, just to, to confirm everyone that the, this will go up on YouTube uh, in probably about sometime next week. And there's a bit of a delay in getting things up, but that should be fine. Um, so on to questions from the audience. So there was a, a very short question that I'm going to expand a little more, I think. Please. The question that came in was, uh, what's meant by a ligotrophic? And I'd like to expand that, I think, into um, with the ligotrophic, we're, we're meaning low, usually we mean low nutrient, but there are lots of different ways of defining it based on chlorophyll concentrations and things like that. So can you expand not just on the term oligotrophic, but what it means and different ways of describing it? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to start like a Greek. And you can see if you see my Greek fat's uh, big wedding, you will see that uh, they were saying, OK, this word comes from the Greek word oligo, which means little, and trophic, which means food. So basically, oligotrophic means a little food, oceans with little food. Eutrophic means a lot of food. So basically, exactly as you said, it's not only the nutrients, it, it is also all the microscopic organisms that they live within the ocean are way less because they have less nutrients. For instance, in the oligotrophic environments, we can see that uh, because these environments are usually warmer and due to the thermal stratification, all the nutrients are trapped below the thermocline. Usually in those places, um, the runoff and the rain to take nutrients from the land towards the oceans, um, it's minimum in comparison, for instance, to the North Atlantic. So it is, when we say oligotrophic, we mean oceanic regions with very little nutrients but also this has an impact not only in the overall abundance but on the size structure as well for instance in every plankton not only phyto but also zooplankton for instance the size of calanus calanoids in the north atlantic the well-known zooplankton that feeds all the fish in the north atlantic such a size does not occur in oligotrophic regions and similar to phytoplankton it's full of prochlorococcus trichodesmium and smaller stuff rather than um, big diatoms and dinoflagellates that we usually see in the more eutrophic basically the ecosystem cannot sustain from the other hand somebody may ask then how come for instance coral reefs are the most productive regions in the globe and of course are surrounded by highly oligotrophic waters and the coral reefs have a different mechanism they are capable of filtering whatever water mass passes through them due to the pores of the corals they're capable and the bacteria decomposition that is fulfilled in those live rocks they're capable of filtering any nutrients in addition to that in the oligotrophic tropical seas the vast majority of the animals and plants live within the reef whatever lives it dies whatever dies it becomes nutrients so they're ecosystems that are self-sustained that's why several decades ago they used to believe and call the coral reefs as oligotrophic ecosystems no they are capable of sustaining themselves by creating this life by holding due to one reason the corals what do the corals provide house house to bacteria house to microorganisms house to fish that's the reason thank you very much there's there's a follow-on question from that which talks about um the differences between warm waters and cold waters and obviously they have different holding capacities or gas fugacities so you know you, you in warmer waters you can hold less gases um but there was a number of people that picked up on asking why cold waters tend to be more nutrient rich 
And I think this comes down to, depending on how much we want to expand, we could go into conservative and non-conservative properties. So things like um, salinity or temperature, if a body of water leaves the surface, those are often considered as conservative properties because the only way to change them is through mixing that water body. You can't, the, the, the energy and the salinity of that water packet are trapped. But nutrients, um, often in deep waters, that's coming from the remineralization of organic matter that's falling out of the surface of the ocean. So, I mean, you can expand more on that if you want, Dio, but it's those deeper waters basically can accrue matter over time, right? There we go. Perfect. Yeah. So if you want to expand on that with that thought, that'd be great. Basically, one easy way to explain is whatever, whatever dies, it sinks and it sinks very fast. Even phytoplankton that is incapable of swimming against the currents, there, is a, there are fantastic papers that they're counting the sinking rate of live and dead phytoplankton. So basically, when the phytoplankton is alive, they have a lot of liquids inside, like fatty acids, omega-3, and many other lighter. That's, it helps them remain at the lit surface. So every organism, when they die, they sink. So basically, the bottom of every oceanic region around the globe is full of nutrients due to the decomposition of bacteria that they transform and the nitrogen cycle um, from uh, ammonia, nitrates, and finally nitrites. Um, so we have all the nutrients are at the bottom of the sea. That's why we have the benthic feeders. We need a mechanism to bring those nutrients up. In the colder places, like the Northern Atlantic, where you have denser waters because the waters are colder, the mixing is happening much easier. And the waves of the open oceanic regions are massive in comparison to an enclosed uh, sea, like the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. So we're talking about lack of light, very strong winds, very strong waves. And these water masses, the colder water masses at surface, become in a sense united with the very cold temperatures at deeper layers. And that's why I have this example because it's all about the density between the different water masses. And if the temperature at surface, due to the bad weather, becomes very close and similar to the temperature of deeper layers, then it starts getting mixed. The moment we have mixing, we have nutrients coming up. This mixing can actually hit the bottom if it is 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 meters depth. It can easily, a very strong mixing, keep hitting the bottom and bringing nutrients up. And that's why you see these uh, very abrupt blooms, even in um, oligotrophic regions, tropical regions, near coral reefs, that they have very abrupt storm. And then you see uh, the whole environment flourishing. So the density, when it's different, we have much stronger differentiation of the two water masses, the much warmer. It's like the air. The warmer air goes towards the ceiling. The colder air, due to the density, drops down. So I hope I explained it a little bit more in details. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, so moving on from that towards more of the um, longer records and the phenology uh, that you were talking about, um, there was a question around, so the shift that you highlighted in the 1980s, um, do you think that's a, let's say, a one-way shift, or is it something that might be part of a longer cyclicity? Do we know? Do we not know? Uh, is the record long enough? I mean, they're all kind of climate-level questions, but I just... Is, 
Indeed, as all the other questions, indeed, it's a very nice uh, question. I'm going to share a screen, if you don't mind, again, so everybody follows. Okay, so we're talking about this abrupt shift. This has been named as a stepwise regime shift. It is not an increasing trend, it's a regime shift. The difference is that it's not a long-term increasing, a long-term increasing trend. However, exactly as the question stated, we have one, a step, and then a new thermal and phytoplankton state. And this is the problem with the regime shifts. And many scientists around the globe, they're looking and there are many detection algorithms for regime shifts and statistical analysis. And people are interested because usually the regime shifts do not come back to the initial states. That's why they're called regime shift. It happens upwards or there is an abrupt decrease usually however it has it, it doesn't come back however it has to do with the length of the time series and that's why it is of high importance to keep collecting and maintaining very long term data sets like the continuous plankton recorder like the seki disk regardless if there are new technologies that say uh, can actually get measurements in a way better way. No, those old measurements, they have one benefit. They use exactly the same methodology. By having the same methodology, they're instantly comparable. So a Seki disk that's due to the citizen science of the, the era, they have millions of measurements all over the globe the last 100 years, can sometimes be more valuable than uh, super duper equipment that we send in a single uh, time and space slot. And uh, I guess also uh, that would take people if they wanted to read more about things like that into the discussions around tipping points. Uh, Very correct. Yeah, yeah. Very correct. Um, for the phenology, so you, you pointed out some links um, and the problems that can occur when there is a mismatch between the phenology of phytoplankton and their um, feeding organisms, so fish or squid or things like that. Um, but there was a question that came up saying, can we use the phytoplankton phenology to detect things like fish migration or fish location? So I guess this would come down to things like habitat modeling, potentially. Very correct. And people, have tried in the past uh, to use satellite derived information in order to plot the spatial extents but also the timing of the blooms in order to help the fisheries sector. In regions like Africa and India that they have the, the fisheries industry, it's not like the Western civilization industry that actually is scooping out all the marine resources, they are capable of managing much better with their smaller boats. Um, and this particular information for Africa and India is particularly useful. And even the governments are trying to have some remote sensing scientists that monitor the bloom in the open ocean and the coastal zones not only the overall abundance, but also uh, the phenology in order to be able to manage their fisheries, but also direct the local fishermen. One could say that this could reduce even further the fish stocks. From the other hand, that's why I started the, uh, the conversation by saying in regions around the world that they don't have a heavy fisheries industry that might help them massively in order not to move around with very small fisheries boats 
not to be away from their families for very long periods of time and also for their safety. From ancient years, Homo sapiens used to know how to manage fisheries resources. It's the new era Homo sapiens that prefers to have everything in the freezer rather than in the open oceans. Uh, questions and wisdom, question answers and wisdom coming here. <laughs> uh, um, so there was a, there was a couple of questions when you were talking about um, stratification and, and mixing, and um, the questions, if I if I wrap them all up into one uh, kind of summary, would be um, maybe if you could spend a few minutes just talking about the differences between which processes. Or what's more important, say, in the open ocean, uh, let's say, uh, coastal shelves, shelf ocean, and then into things like um, estuaries or even inland waters? Okay. In the inland waters, I'm not an expert, of course, on lakes or uh, rivers, but in general, the inland waters are way more shallow. So... Any wind-driven current or wave or a force, an atmospheric force, can actually mix these waters in a much easier and faster way. In general, the inland waters, they don't have a big issue with nutrients availability. The lakes have this color the very dark green because they're very eutrophic. Some of them, they look like uh, a dirty port uh, because they're very eutrophic and they have very high level of nutrients. Where do they find? Usually lakes are surrounded by forests. Uh, in those forests, it rains. Any live material, any organic carbon that enters into the lake, like leaves, broken branches, any type of wood that will eventually become nutrients. So lakes do not have an issue usually with lack of nutrients. They have an issue with excess nutrients. So stratification you can still see in the lakes with exactly the same. I'm going to give an example of the people that uh, they have managed to swim in temperate or tropical seas. When we swim and we dive during a very calm day, our body sometimes enters in a much colder zone. And we can see even if we stand that the upper body is warmer and the legs, or if we dive a little bit deeper, we suddenly enter in a much colder zone. This has to do with a thermal stratification. Of course, it's diurnal thermal stratification, and it's something that the moment we have a wind driven uh, or any other mechanism or a wave, it's going to break and mixing will occur. So we can see the stratification exactly as we see with the open oceanic in very shallow waters, in lakes and in the open oceanic. When we are at the open oceanic, this thermocline could occur at very deep layers. Three, four hundred, for instance, uh, the thermocline in the Red Sea could be at uh, 250, 300 meters depth. So we're talking about pretty deep. The problem with the Red Sea, for instance, is that even at 2,500 meters depth, the temperature is 20 degrees. 18 to 20 degrees. So we're talking about one of the warmest uh, ecosystems, marine ecosystems on Earth. So from this point of view, we understand that due to the fact that the difference of temperature between the bottom temperatures and the surface is not very big, which means it's from 20 until 28 degrees of Celsius, even this differentiation, which is not very big, and in the whole tropical zone, usually the temperature 
as the atmospheric temperature does not deviate much. It's more or less stable and warm. However, even one degree of Celsius is enough to change the density so much that the thermocline will be formed and it will trap the nutrients below. After all, the whole climate change and warming that our ocean sea, we're not talking about degrees of Celsius, we're talking about 0 0.8 degrees of Celsius. Is this enough? It is more than enough to stratify the environment. And whatever mechanism, and this is something that we have to bear in mind and remember, whatever mechanism, regardless of temperature, and how stratified the environment is. If there is any mechanism that will bring nutrients from a different source, horizontally or from above, from a dust, we're going to see a bloom. So, oceanic warming is helping the stratification to become stronger and actually trap the nutrient below the mixed layer. Okay, yeah, so that answers, I mean, I was, there was also a question about whether or not, um, let's say, uh, during El Nino and warming events, whether that will trap more and prevent uh, blooms, and that's pretty much what you've just been going into. But exactly. I think, I think the take-home message there is that you need to understand the fundamental concepts of stratification, you know, advection, um, and mixing. But then you also need to understand the dynamics of the region you're studying, because as you just explained, the Red Sea is, you know, if the water changes from 20 to 21 degrees there, that's very different to if it changes between 20 and 21 degrees, um, let's say around the UK. It's a very different system. Tides will be different as you get with the monsoons. What's causing advection will be different. Um, you know, the depth of the stratification, the level of nutrient input. So. Yeah, I think it's the examples you've shown have really been very useful. But um, I also think that when pe people are thinking about their own areas, you know, they have to take that model and really understand what's transferable and what's different in their own. Uh, exactly, area. Tom. Exactly as you said. That's why I showed an example of the Red Sea and the correlation that it has with the multivariate Enzo index. Uh, Berenfeld and Tony have shown very nicely across the, the equator and the tropical zone an extremely tight relationship between ENZO, anti-correlation, uh, strong ENZO, primary production and chlorophyll drop, and vice versa. And this is because of the thermal stratification and the warm that El Nino brings, and the opposite of La Nina. In the Red Sea, one of the warmest environments on Earth, marine environments. The thermal stratification is extremely high. During El Nino, we have higher phytoplankton biomass and more duration. And this is because the nutrients in the majority of the Red Sea are coming through a horizontal influx advection from the Indian Ocean. And during El Nino, the winds responsible for this influx, they're way stronger, approximately 30% stronger. And that's why, exactly, Tom, people need to search their own regions. Of course, we have a logic, we have the books, we have the papers, but we certainly have not investigated and found everything. I hope not, because I'm not going to have a job from tomorrow. <laughs> The, um, there was a question around the, the really strong 2003 anomaly, and um, the question was whether or not uh, you observed anything similar in the Aegean Sea. No. Oh. In 2003? No. I haven't observed anything similar in the Aegean Sea. I didn't report the mechanism in this talk because for every paper I, we, there is a different mechanism. But very briefly, what happened in 2003 in the Red Sea, that's why we didn't spot that in the nearby Aegean Sea, is the fact that uh, in October 2003, through the mountains over Africa, 
that there is a gap between the big mountains of Sudan and Eritrea. There is a natural gap of the mountains. This is an excellent place for channeling. When wind blows through a channel, it intensifies based on physics. This October, the direction and the strength over those mountains of the winds was extremely high. We don't know why, but it was extremely high. So uh, after the Tokar jets, it was actually start spinning and rotating like a dipole, anticyclonic and cyclonic eddy, an extremely strong one. One of the strongest eddies we have seen. That cyclonic eddy start pumping up nutrients because the cyclone in the northern hemisphere that moves like that, front and right, it starts bringing nutrients up. So basically, uh, the central Red Sea came across nutrients reservoirs that hasn't seen for several years. The moment that happens, it doesn't matter if it is summer or winter. It doesn't matter if it is fully stratified. The moment you have light and nutrients, phytoplankton is going to grow. Um, okay, the only I think a couple more, maybe two or three more questions. Um, so uh, there was one around. Well, okay, so there's there's two questions, both related to um, uh, phytoplankton or phenology metrics. So I'll see if we can wrap them into one discussion. Uh, the first question is around why sometimes you have a correlation, and sometimes you you seem to have a correlation between, uh, say, phytoplankton and fish, but there's a lag. And that lag could be maybe a year or something like that. Um, and another question is, if you're looking at different um, metrics, but they're related, so, for example, duration and start time are related, because if you have an earlier start time, you're more likely to have potentially a longer duration if the end time doesn't change. Yeah, I will start... Yeah. When we look at those, um, each of those metrics in relation to some other indicator like fish abundance or recruitment, we have, to, I guess, the question is asking, you know, how do we make sure that we don't double count because those aren't independent metrics? So it's just a, a discussion on it. So first, I think if we talk about um, correlations and lags, and then we can come on to uh, independent metrics. Perfect. You may need to remind me the second part, although the second question can be easily answered. Can I start with the second if you don't mind? Perfect. Uh, the duration depends on the initiation and termination. So initiation and duration are not linked without the information of the termination. And the duration of the bloom moves and becomes smaller or longer based on the initiation and termination. That's why some years we may have exactly the same duration. Typically, one month and a half. A given year, we have a month and a half. So that means normality. You plot the anomaly, zero. However, if you go to the other metrics, you will realize that we had a two months later initiation, but a two months earlier termination. By having that, you have exactly the same duration. So basically, what you need is duration, initiation, and termination. Actually, the duration is calculated based on the initiation and the termination. And that's why they're related, but not in the sense that you can use only duration and say, I didn't find the link or I found the link or only the initiation. That's why we play with all the different metrics and we need all of them in order to say in a given year, this has been an anomalously year for phenology. Okay. I hope this is more clear. I should have mentioned a few I things so. in my presentation. Yeah. Excellent. And the first question regarding the lag. Uh, whoever asked this question is very right. I didn't mention that 
even the plots that I'm relating, it's with one year lag. This is usually, and we find especially with fisheries, uh, when we play with fisheries landing data sets, we usually have um, a few months or a year. In that case, it is a year lag. So basically the 2003 bloom relates with the 2004 fisheries landings. This is because what's, when there is a very big bloom, it is the larvae usually that they feed upon the phytoplankton. There are some species of adults that they feed directly on phytoplankton or zooplankton, but usually it's the fish larvae or the squid, the cephal cephalopod larvae, depending on the species that they feed directly on zooplankton or phytoplankton. So usually for those changes to be seen in fisheries landing data sets, sometimes you need at least a year. A year in order to be big enough to be caught. Because we're not fishing fish larvae, we're fishing the adults. We're fishing the fish that we eat. That's why in those cases, I prefer and I run it only with animals that are very close to the bottom of the food chain. I wouldn't take a snapper or a grouper of 20 kilos landings and link it with fisheries yield. I think that would be a mistake. We need small pelagic, small stuff, very close, uh, planktivores, for instance, anchovies, sardines, and small pelagic that are planktivores, animals that they feed upon plankton directly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think maybe just one more. Um, Please. Lauren, was there a question about deoxygenation? Did you want to raise that? Um, well, I can ask this closely if it's okay to you because um, I'm recently learning a little bit more about deoxygenation zones and how sometimes that balance between nutrient inputs of things that are degrading near the surface floor switch into something that causes deoxygenation. And there are these growing deoxygenation zones that are hopefully kept down by the stratification you were talking about. But because this is new to me and I was like, ooh, you know so much about this, I wonder if you can tell me a little bit more about how everything that you've talked about may or may not relate to formation of deoxygenation zones, maybe degassing if they do mix, or is this something more dangerous? I'd love to hear anything you know about it, but if you don't, I apologize for asking a selfish question. Thanks, TJ. <laughs> so, colder waters are capable of holding more oxygen because the oxygen bonds um, are way stronger and easier to bond, just not to talk uh, heavy physics, but the bonds of the oxygen are bonding all the molecules with each other way easier and stronger in cold waters. So basically, the moment that the temperature is getting warmer, we have less oxygen. One of the problems of climate warming is that regions that rely on the vertical mixing to have more oxygenated zones um, may start having issues. In general, the warmer waters contain less oxygen. That's why even in the plot of the bioargo float that I showed in the Red Sea during the winter time, the whole vertical column was full of oxygen. It's not only from phytoplankton that they produce oxygen, but due to the colder water masses that have penetrated, they have come up towards the surface and the whole water column becomes oxygenated. And it is one of those, imagine, one of the interesting uh, papers that we worked with Vasilis Papadopoulos, um, a physical oceanographer. He brought some data sets and they had oxygen 
they told me that we see this oxygen line from zero meters up to 700 meters depth in the Red Sea, just a straight line, which means that the levels of oxygen are homogeneous in the whole water column. What, what do you think? I said, I don't know what has caused, but what I'm interested in is to see the impact on phytoplankton. Because when you see one vertical line straight of the same oxygen quantities, that means mixing. That means homogeneous oxygen, everything is mixed, which means a lot of nutrients. And we played um, and we published a paper in 2014 uh, it was one very strong event that caused the vertical mixing to a superb level, penetrating nutrient reservoirs, uh, and everything started from the oxygen levels that they had the measurements from a SIP measurements. Especially in the coastal regions and very shallow regions, further warming means further lack of oxygen. And the, another issue is sometimes with more warming, less phytoplankton that they produce oxygen, not only physically wise, the water column becomes more less oxygenated, but it has less phytoplankton that they produce oxygen, especially in the tropical and temperate seas, because opposite phenomena may be seen at higher latitudes, okay, that they're light limited and not nutrient limited. Actually, so there were a couple of questions that have come in just while we were discussing those last points. So I think I can probably, I'll try and cover those off now so I think I can answer those two. But uh, if you want to chip in, Dio, uh, yes, free. And, and I think we'll probably call it after that. So the last, so the last two questions, there was one around um, the phenology of phytoplankton functional types and whether that can be used to predict global primary uh, intensification or changes in primary production. The other question that in my mind is somewhat related um, was around whether or not the changes from warming are going to be more profound in tropical seas or temperate regions or, you know, which areas of the ocean might we see more of a shift. And I think this, um, the reason I say I think these are linked is because there isn't a single answer for either of these. So the effect of global warming, um, as we know, there's a difference between what we might call the observed change and the impact. So we know, for example, in the Arctic, the temperatures have changed by a greater magnitude. There's a, there's a more degrees of warming in the Arctic um, than there are at, low, at, higher, at lower latitudes. But um, as Dio was saying, it depends whether that change in one degree takes you over a regime shift or it takes you over a tipping point. Um, and you don't always know when that's going to occur. We can try and we can look at past events and, and anomalies and, and um, look through even the geological record for similar situations to try and forecast uh, what the impact might be. But to say all tropical uh, seas or all temperate seas are more or less sensitive to one degree or two degree shift is tricky because it depends on whether you're a temperate sea that is, let's say, open ocean, or you're a temperate sea that's coastal, or you're a temperate sea that's an enclosed basin. Um, they all have very different um, uh, regimes and might have a very different response to one degree warming, depending on stratification and everything else. As for the phytoplankton functional types, um, Again, it depends. So you might see a change in phytoplankton. And we, I would say go back and look at the other lectures we had, both on primary production, on climate change, um, and uh, uh, Heather's talk on community structure, um, because you can change the community, but keep the chlorophyll concentrations the same, and the growth might be similar. But it might be that the species, if you change the community structure, um, the primary production doesn't change, but the fisheries collapse because they don't feed very well on those organisms or they're toxic. Um, so, um, yes, I think we can we can use phenology metrics with PFTs, um, but using that to say something um, singular about the change in primary production is a little dangerous. But feel free to expand on that, Dio, as you, as you would. It is certainly an interesting approach um, 
to run the phenology metrics on, for instance, higher phytoplankton like diatoms, if there is a diatom algorithm or a higher size structure phytoplankton. But we have to bear in mind that when we decompose the signal of the reflectances and we create the phytoplankton functional types, we are not going to have a very strong seasonal cycle. Actually, the seasonal cycle will be extremely strong based on the PFT. For instance, if we get the large cells, we're going to have an abrupt shift, let's say, during the winter time and then diminishing and other community structure of smaller will start picking up, let's say, during the summer. So the phenology algorithm can certainly tell you um, if in a given year the typical higher phytoplankton uh, structure, diatoms or dinoflagellates, if this data, data sets occur, they can tell you if this particular year was outstanding or not. And this could be eventually be related um, to fisheries and higher trophic levels like zooplankton, depending on the da available data sets. Tom, one of the uh, questions about the nature of nutrients. Um, that I quickly spot inside. Uh, I, 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 I'm, not that. Very, I'm not very good uh, with uh, scrolling up and down, but I spotted it uh, regarding the, the nature of nutrients. There are some environments um, that they have nitrate, they have phosphates, some seas are phosphate limited, some others are nitrogen limited, and some others are ion limited. For instance, uh, Tom, uh, recently you published a very nice paper in Nature along with uh, your co-authors about uh, the Australian fires um, and how from the fires, the organic carbon from terrestrial and the ion was transferred through aeolian trajectories and winds over a region of the Southern Ocean that was not oligotrophic in general, but ion limited for sure. So the limiting factor was ion. And the moment you have ion limitation and suddenly abruptly you have this particular nutrient, you have a bloom. For instance, the Mediterranean Sea is not ion limited. There is Sahara, dust storms every now and then, it's full of ion. It is certainly not ion limited. So it depends on the region. Uh, for instance, Madagascar blooms that are ion limited. Ion is limited. Uh, so there are particular species that are depending on specific uh, nutrients that they need. Yeah, when so I guess, I guess I, it, the, the answer is, is that it, it's not necessarily all nutrients, it's whatever is your limiting exactly. nutrient or, or former, former nutrient. And I guess in those environments, um, again, the, the attendee uh, may know better than us, but in, the, the blooms will occur when there is a change, right? You have to have a change in the system. So that will be whatever is the limiting factor, which yeah, at high latitudes in the Arctic or things might be the increase in light. In the Red Sea, it might be um, you know deep mixing, pulling up nutrients from below or advection of nutrients in from the monsoon. And in another area, it might be the presence of a micronutrient like iron or even um, manganese uh, or magnesium and other things have, have been uh, proposed. Very good. Um, once we have that, then we can have a bloom. And then once you've got a bloom, then you can begin with your phenological assessment. Okay, um, that's it's coming up on the on the two o'clock mark here. So um, thank you all for your questions. Thank you for attending. It's been, um, I think the discussion has been very interesting. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the lecture, uh, Dio. Um, I think you said already people are welcome to reach out and contact you um, if they have any further questions. Um, so uh, they should be able to find you um, Online. I'm very, very glad that uh, people liked it and enjoyed and they perhaps learned a little bit uh, 
something and thank you very much for the invitation. Always my pleasure. All right. Always. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for attending and for the very nice questions. Thank you.